just getting the technology problem out of the way first. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Robert Shappy. I'm a partner with Harrison Co. CPAs. I um, am excited this morning. We have a great program put together. And uh, this is our fourth annual economic and tax planning event. It is uh, a real testament to the value of this program that every year our attendance has increased um, fairly dramatically. I was uh, joking with one of our speakers this morning that uh, I was going to put the attendance for last year and the attendance for this year and see if we could compare the two and make sure that we actually had more people this year than last year. But I didn't have a current picture of this year and I didn't want to make one up. so. I could have taken a picture with empty tables, I guess, before we started, but I, uh, I'm re I really appreciate all of you being here, and uh, we uh, endeavor to put this program together to provide a benefit to our clients, our friends um, in the community, and to really uh, give some information that's useful and uh, pertinent to you and your business. I'd like to just take a second to introduce some of the team. Managing partner of the firm, Cheryl Guidi. Josh Tyree's back in the back, making sure nobody escapes. And uh, the rest of the team, I think, is all over. You can uh, recognize us by our blue name tags. And uh, appreciate all the hard work and effort that each of them put in to put this together, because it is a joint effort. We, every year, get the entire firm in the room figure out exactly what every single person is going to do to participate and to make this event better every year. So thank you to all of them for their hard work. With all that, then, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker. Megan Ronk has been the director of the Idaho Department of Commerce since January of 2016. Prior to being appointed director, Ronk served as Idaho's Commerce Chief Operating Officer. Ronk's prior roles include Executive Director of the Idaho Meth Project, a Strategic Projects Manager for Blue Cross of Idaho, and a Policy Advisor to Governor Dirk Kempthorne. She also has been an adjunct faculty member teaching microeconomics at the College of Western Idaho since 2010, and a member of the Idaho Human Rights Commission since 2008. Ronk has a BA in Business Administration from the College of Idaho and an MBA from the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Please join me in welcoming Director Megan Ronk. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today, and I'm excited to share a little bit of uh, some of the perspective that we're seeing at the Idaho Department of Commerce in terms of Idaho's economy and where we see some of the growth opportunities moving forward. As, uh, as Robert mentioned, I've been the director for just a little over a year, and what, a, what an honor and privilege it is to basically each and every day have um, the, the privilege of talking about something that I'm absolutely passionate about, which is the state of Idaho. I grew up in Mountain Home. Um, Idaho is my home. I love this place. And my goal um, and, and the goal of my team, which a lot, several of my team members, Bobby Joe and Kim and Jenny and Cindy, are sitting over here at this table. So if you have some follow-up questions afterwards, uh, feel free to talk to myself or any of them. But, you know, I think, like, like me, our team every day is out there talking about what a great place Idaho is to do business, what a great place this is to live and recreate. And um, at the end of the day, my goal is I'm probably like many of you who are parents and grandparents, I'm a mom. I've got two little boys that are three and six. And, uh, you know, I hope someday they, you know, finish school and go out and explore the world. But I want, I want to make sure that this is a place that they can come back to if they choose to, that this is a place where there are great career opportunities um, and they can come back here and live and make a good living and raise their family. So that's my motivation each and every day. And so I'm excited to share with you about some of the things we have happening within the Idaho Department of Commerce. You know, over the last several years, 
there, Idaho has really been on the map, and people are starting to take notice of some of the things that our state has to offer. Just a few logos up on the screen there. Kiplinger ranked us as the number one state for fastest job growth. Governing Magazine, number one state for job growth. Uh, CompTIA, number two state for tech sector growth. And CNBC, which does a series of business rankings, has um, ranked us most recently as the number five state for business friendliness, number six for cost of doing business, and number seven for cost of living. And, you know, I, sometimes we take some of these rankings with a, a little bit of a grain of salt, but uh, the thing I just want to highlight is that consistently Idaho is recognized by some of the major publications throughout the country as a great place to do business. And as a result of that, we at Department of Commerce are increasingly seeing high levels of activity of companies that are looking to relocate here or looking to expand here. And, you know, that's not to say that we certainly don't have some challenges that we face as a state. Um, I would say that talent attraction and, and, and workforce continues to be one of our biggest challenges, and that's why I'm especially proud that the governor and the legislature this session will hopefully continue to make um, increased investments in education, especially in the area of career technical education, uh, where we continue to see challenges in being able to meet some of our current workforce needs. So we're on the right track. We have work to do, but um, I think compared to a lot of other states, and at least when I talk to some of my counterparts in other states, there's, there's some envy about where we stand right now in the state of Idaho. A couple of other statistics that I'll point out. Uh, Idaho's unemployment increased 3.6% between March 2015 and March 2016, which was the nation's largest percentage increase during that period of time. So steady growth in employment. Our state's GDP increased by 2.8% in the second quarter of 2016, which is the third largest increase nationally, and within the Pacific Northwest region, we were number two. And wages, um, mostly due to the, de the, the, the demand for um, talent, continue to increase. We saw about a 4.2% increase in the second quarter of 2016, which was twice the national average. So job growth, wage growth, continued growth um, overall in our state's economy. When um, our team is out there working with companies throughout the state, you know, there's several um, areas where we continue to, to see um, new capital investment and, and expect growth to continue. Obviously, agriculture continues to be a strong foundation of our economy, um, and we expect that agriculture, but more important, food processing or, or adding value to the, the raw products that we produce throughout the state will continue to be a growth sector in the years to come. Um, Idaho still makes things, which I am always really excited about. Manufacturing, whether it's our aerospace industry, which is strong both in here in the Treasure Valley, but also in the northern part of the state, we continue to experience growth. Uh, we have quite a few companies engaged in steel fabrication and other forms of advanced manufacturing, and we expect that to continue to grow as well moving forward. And then uh, finally, we continue to see strength in the technology sector, whether it's data processing or other information services, uh, cloud-based software companies. Um, as, as I mentioned in one of the previous rankings, Idaho has continued to be strong in technology, and we certainly hope to foster that growth in the years to come. So a couple of things that we do at the state level to encourage and support business growth and expansion. We have a team uh, that is solely responsible for business attraction. And so what that means is not only are we, when companies looking to expand or relocate, many of them engage professional site selectors to basically help them shop around for the best location and determine, you know, frankly, where they can get not only their best long-term business deal, but they're also looking for incentives. And so uh, that team uh, is working with those site selectors and corporate decision makers to encourage them to invest their capital in Idaho. But they're also engaged in proactively targeting companies that might be um, 
looking to make a move or perhaps they're a, a supply chain partner in a company that already has a presence here and we can help make a business case why there would be some cost advantages for them to expand their operations into Idaho. I would say um, increasingly we see a lot of interest from California companies that are you know that's been a trend for for several years but it's uh, particularly hot right now where we've got companies just saying get us out of this place. The, the environmental regulations and um, the tax burden continues to grow and even though you know we may be a three generation business and have our roots in California, we just can't do this anymore. So a lot of interest from companies in California um, and other states that have been um, have, have implemented less business friendly policies over the, the last several years. But as I mentioned, um, our team working with our regional economic development partners throughout the state, we track site visits as really a true sign of a genuine interest that a company is looking to expand into our state. You know, it's one thing for a company to get on our website and, you know, d dig for some data and maybe do some um, initial analysis about what their tax burden could look like in Idaho. You know, it's another step for them to call and actually have a, a conference call with our team and start digging into the numbers and, and our incentive programs. But for them to jump on a plane, take the time to spend a couple of days in Idaho and actually, you know, get on the ground and look at sites for us, again, is a, a, a very real and tangible sign of interest. And so, as you can see over the last couple of years, the site visits that our team tracks that have come to Idaho have continued to grow. Uh, during, you know, because we were kind of coming out of the recession, 2011 was a pretty, uh, pretty slow year with only 13 site visits. But this past year in 2016, our team managed over 70 site visits of companies that were, were here looking for land, looking for buildings. But it's not just business attraction that is important to diversifying and growing our team's economy, or our, our state's economy. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, one of the best ways that we can continue to grow is to look, you know, across the room here today, those of you who are already here in Idaho, who have invested in Idaho, and who have a history in Idaho. And so um, at the state level, over the last couple of months, we have really ramped up our effort to ensure that we, we are paying attention to the needs of our Idaho companies and doing everything we can at the state level to, to help them continue to grow and expand in our state. Uh, just, so just in October, we formed a new business retention and expansion team whose sole responsibility is to go out, working in hand in hand with our local partners, and find out what are the needs of our existing companies. You know, what are their opportunities to growth? What are the barriers to growth that we might be able to influence at the state level? And let them know that all of the tools and incentives that we have available for new companies coming to the state are absolutely available for those existing companies that continue to grow and invest jobs and capital in Idaho as well. And I think that's um, you know one message. If there's a takeaway for you today, is I just like to reiterate that point. You know, it's often the new companies coming to our state that get the headlines in the media, but all of the tools and incentives that we have available are there to help you as existing Idaho companies grow and expand as well. Um, one of the, the newer tools that I'd love to talk about that it's been, um, has been particularly impactful uh, in encouraging business growth and expansion in Idaho has been the tax reimbursement incentive. Um, and a lot of kudos goes to Harris and Company and specifically Robert who have been partners along with us at the Idaho Department of Commerce in, in really putting um, the structure behind this program. But in essence, just to give you a snapshot, the tax reimbursement incentive went into effect, uh, it was passed uh, three years ago, so it's been about two and a half years that it's been active. And this for us has really been a game changer, again, in our ability to both encourage existing companies to grow and expand, but also to attract new business to the state. What it does is for companies who, in an urban area, which is a, a community that's a population of 25,000 or more, those companies that um, create 50 new jobs 
that pay above the average county wage. Again, we're looking to continue to elevate wages and bring those livable wage jobs to the state. Um, and then in rural communities, if you create 20 jobs that pay above the average county wage, you are potentially eligible for a, a, a refundable tax credit of up to 30% for up to 15 years. And so again, as we look at this very competitive environment, both nationally and frankly throughout the globe, where we are at a state level competing for both our existing companies and new companies to invest capital in the state, this has become a very meaningful tool for us to be able to encourage that growth here in Idaho. Um, in just two and a half years since this incentive went into effect, we've supported 33 different companies throughout the state. We project um, that about a little over 5,000 jobs will be created, 2.3 billion in uh, new wages coming to the state. The average wage for these jobs is just a little shy of $47,000, which is uh, quite a bit above our, our average wage at a state level. And almost, we're just getting really close to a billion dollars in capital investment in the state. So again, this has been a really meaningful tool for Idaho. Um, if you look at the value of the credits that we're issuing back to these companies versus the new revenue that we project is coming to the state, we are projecting about a four to one return on investment. And so, you know, legislators are constantly asking, what are we getting for, for these, um, for this tool and how can we show that it's, it's having the intended results and we're tracking that very closely and making sure that um, we call this a performance based tool because really it requires that companies earn their way into our economy. They don't get the credit up front. They, um, you know, this is, this is not Idaho like other states writing big checks and you know, building buildings and buying land in order to lure companies here. This is giving companies who create jobs and good wage jobs and are paying taxes a refund of those taxes back to encourage them to continue to grow and expand in our state. Um, just a, a couple of other statistics about the tax reimbursement incentive. Again, I mentioned there have been 33 projects that we have uh, supported in the last two and a half years. One of the criticisms that we had from the legislature early on was that, you know, this is probably only going to help Boise, um, and it's probably only going to be used for new companies. But very organically, I would say the, the opposite has been the case. Uh, we've had 18 of these expansion and relocation projects in rural communities in Idaho, and 16 of the 33 have been existing Idaho companies who've leveraged it for an expansion. And just a, a snapshot of a couple of the companies that we worked with, probably some names and logos you're familiar with. I'll just highlight a couple of stories that I think are, are particularly interesting in the state. Um, the first one is Dow. Everybody's heard of Dow Chemical. Well, thanks to the tax reimbursement incentive and a, and a lot of hard work by our local friends in the city of Burley, Dow has made its first investment in Idaho uh, in their one of their building materials products. They are uh, right now in the process of building a new manufacturing facility in Burley, Idaho. So that's very exciting for that rural community. Um, Orgill, has anybody heard of the company Orgill before? Probably not. Um, but Orgill is a, a really interesting story and a company that I think just fits within the culture of Idaho. Uh, so any of you who've spent time in the northern part of the state may have heard of a, a company called Kimball Furniture. And Kimball um, was a, a, obviously a furniture manufacturer. During the economic downturn, they had to close their facility in Post Falls. And it put hundreds of people out of work and left us with this absolutely beautiful facility that was vacant. Um, and so we've, over the last couple of years, been trying to market that facility to, to potential customers to come in and, and acquire it. But we found the perfect fit in this company, Orgill. So the company, Orgill, actually has its roots back to the 1850s. It used to be called Orgill Brothers because it was two brothers who were servicing the wagon trains as they headed, they were out east, and as the wagon trains were heading out west, they were hard, hardware distributors. So as, as families were heading west and they needed 
some tools and sundries and things to pack up in their wagons to make the trip out west. That's what Orgel built their business on, and they still do that today. They are essentially the, the back office storeroom for all of the small mom and pop hardware stores throughout the country. And so um, Orgill has invested in Idaho, acquired that former Kimball facility, and um, have created a new distribution center that's servicing all of their customers in the Pacific Northwest and also as they, um, as they expand into to Canadian markets. And so it was a perfect location for them. And again, these are like salt of the earth people. I mean, there's, I know sometimes um, there's questions about, you know, are we recruiting these fly-by-night companies into the state? But I think a company that has a foundation since the 1850s is probably a pretty safe bet. So we're especially excited to have Orgill in Idaho now. One final example of an, of an existing Idaho company that has very strong roots in Idaho that we've leveraged the tax reimbursement incentive for an expansion is Wood Grain Millworks, um, multi-generation company that's been in Idaho. Uh, they leverage the tax reimbursement incentive to not only expand their facility in Fruitland, but um, those of you who are familiar with Emmett know that you know quite a few years ago the sawmill in Emmett closed down. Um, again, putting people out of work, that was really the lifeblood of that community. And uh, Wood Grain Millworks, through leverage, leveraging the tax reimbursement incentive and other support, have been able to acquire that mill in Emmett. They're investing significant amount of capital to upgrade that facility and make it a state-of-the-art mill and to put people back to work again. So those are just a few examples of, you know, when you, when you look at tax credits and what types of companies are these, these benefiting in our state, um, I thought it would be helpful to just highlight a few stories. Um, as, again, I talked a little earlier about growth in particular industry sector, and I just thought I'd highlight some of the industries that we've worked with specifically through the tax reimbursement incentive. Again, aerospace continues to be strong, food manufacturing, metal fabrication, um, and then to a lesser extent, kind of on the, the smaller side of the projects we've worked on, has been on, on the tourism end. Uh, those of you who've traveled in Sun Valley, in the Wood River Valley lately, you know that there's two new ho hotel projects that are under construction there. Um, one of them is the Limelight Hotel, which just had its grand opening this past week, and you got to check it out. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, and, you know, you kind of wonder, well, why tourism, why hotels? This was probably something I, I don't know that we ever envisioned supporting a hotel um, investment with the tax reimbursement incentive, but they qualified. They were hiring the number of people that was required. They were paying actually really great wages. And, you know, as you know, tourism is a major industry in that particular community. So our ability to be able to support continued growth, um, you know, we, we worked closely with the Sun Valley Company, uh, you know, because we always like to make sure as we're evaluating these projects that we're not harming any existing Idaho companies. And they said, you know, that's great. Gr hotel beds, additional beds in Sun Valley is a good thing for us. So we are fully on board with you um, doing what you can to support this type of investment in the Wood River Valley. Oh, so um, moving into sort of what is what are some of our plans moving forward, especially as we look at this legislative session um, going on right now. There are a couple of things that we're working on that you may hear about. Um, we are looking at one small modification to the tax reimbursement incentive. Um, as I mentioned, in order to qualify in, in a rural community, 20 jobs is the minimum threshold. And based on feedback that we've gotten throughout the state, you know, I try to get out there as much as possible and visit every little nook and cranny as does our team. Um, you know, rural Idaho is still struggling and we see a lot of growth in our, our more metro areas and even our mid-sized communities, but it's communities like you know, Smelterville and um, Victor, Idaho, and Orofino, that, I mean, those are some of the challenges that, yeah, just yesterday I got a, an, um, um, we got an email from the mayor of New Meadows that says, you know, gosh, we have so many people driving through our community every day, but to get business here, I mean, we are struggling, what do we do? 
And so um, we're hoping to get support from the legislature this session to create a new micro designation for the tax reimbursement incentive, looking at communities that are 5,000 or less, so again, some of our, our most rural pockets that are still struggling, um, that they would have to create 10 jobs. Um, I think this is a much more attainable goal for them um, to be able to attract a small employer or encourage an existing company to expand. And so that's one change um, that you'll see us pursuing this legislative session. Um, the other one that I think we'll have some interesting discussion this, this session um, relates to an opportunity that we at Commerce have seen over the past couple of years. And, you know, I, I, obviously it's for the policymakers, our elected officials, to decide the direction that our state goes. But I feel like when we see a business opportunity, it's our responsibility at Commerce to bring that forward so that we can at least have a public discussion about it. And one of the opportunities that's presented itself over the last couple of years is in the area of data centers. So we all know that everything is moving to the cloud, but the cloud, as you know, is not really in the cloud. It's, it's a data center someplace, somewhere, that you don't really care where it is as long as your data is safe and secure. And with the absolute explosion of technology and, and everything moving to the cloud, there are companies, um, and these are your companies you can you know, name them, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, I mean, they are, are screaming for locations to locate data centers, and we've had a lot of interest in the last couple of years. Um, we have a perfect environment for data centers. We have, obviously, land available. Um, you know, they typically like to be near a metro area where they can have air service, but obviously a little outside of town um, so that they can maintain the security of their facilities. We have very competitive, low power rates, and. Um, and many of these companies have a, a um, what's the right word? A, they, have, they, they look to the social good, and so having um, a good energy portfolio that uh, looks great when you examine renewable energy is, is a really important factor for many of these companies. We have low geographic risk, I mean, in terms of floods, I guess I shouldn't say that right now, because we may have some floods. <laughs> but generally, we're a pretty safe place that we don't have major hurricanes and earthquakes and things of that nature. And they love our uh, desert, high desert climate, because during the summer months, when their energy costs are very expensive to be able to cool these facilities, they can pull in the ambient cool air in the evenings, and you know, they take advantage of that free cooling for energy efficiency. But the one piece that's been missing for us is um, with regard to sales tax. Um, there are about 30 other states that either have no sales tax or some sort of exemption or rebate as it relates to the equipment in these data centers. And typically, a, a large-scale Tier 1 data center is spending anywhere between 100 to $150 million every three to five years on technology upgrades. And so, um, when you add another 6% on that in Idaho, it becomes, you know, they're penciling out their deals. Idaho looks good on paper, but um, it's been difficult for us to land one of these projects. So we are bringing forward this session a, a rebate on the, the a sales tax rebate on data center equipment. Um, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, exemptions and rebates are always a popular discussion with the legislature, and so I'm sure there'll be some vigorous debate about it, but again, um, I think this is an, an area where we currently don't have a lot of activity, but there's great opportunity for us to bring in some of these companies and really continue to build a more robust technology ecosystem. Um, in closing, and then I'll, I'd be happy to take comments. I mean, I mentioned earlier about my personal passion for Idaho and why it's just an honor and privilege for me to do this job every day. But um, a couple of weeks ago, I know that most of you probably looked to Vogue magazine for your latest and greatest information. Um, but Vogue magazine had a really special feature about Idaho. Uh, they they um, published a list of the 10 hottest travel destinations in the world, right? The entire world. And Idaho was one of the 10 on that list. Uh, we were, there were no other US states um, 
the, I think, Malaysia and Sri Lanka and Madagascar, like these very exotic locations. And one of the things, in, there was a write-up about Idaho and why they chose Idaho as this unique place that just people have to go to. And the first sentence of that, of that article said, Idaho is having a moment. And I could not agree with that more. It's such a poignant point, but it reaffirms what my team and I experience each and every day. Idaho is having a moment, and whether it's from a business perspective and people taking notice of what our state has to offer, or obviously in this case, um, being on the map is one of the best places in the world to live and recreate. We all know that. That's why we live here, and that's why we choose to continue to live here and raise our families here. But the world is taking notice, and, um, and it's an exciting time to be part of this state, and I can't wait to see what the future holds. So thank you for your time this morning, and uh, happy to answer any, any questions that you may have. for questions. Well, thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ronk. I, I will tell you that from my interactions with Commerce and the whole team down there, they are uh, very passionate about attracting new businesses to Idaho and helping existing businesses expand in the state. And so I think that uh, they deserve a lot of kudos for that. And many times faced with uh, some overwhelming obstacles uh, when it comes to, to the things that we need to uh, accomplish. So um, with that, can you lock the doors? It's the tax update time. So. <laughs> Let's see if I can get my technology. I was actually just uh, trolling uh, my Twitter feed to see if there was any changes I needed to make to my slides. Is there? <laughs> happening on an almost minute by minute basis lately. So I wanted to start um, today and just talk a little bit about um, some of the things that happened in 2016 related to taxes. As you'll recall, um, last year, well, December of 2015, we were all sitting around middle of December trying to figure out whether or not we wanted to buy equipment or whether we needed to buy some some new stuff to get that tax deduction but we weren't really sure if we were going to get a tax deduction or not so there were uh, there was a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace um, a lot of uh, a lot of you were questioning whether or not uh, the right uh, path was to to do certain things and so luckily uh, we did not have that same problem this year um, and that's because in December of 2015, uh, the PATH Act was passed, which made many of our incentives, tax incentives, permanent. Um, and so I just wanted to reiterate some of those uh, incentives, go through them, and talk about uh, uh, several of the items that will sunset over the next couple of years, but we're getting uh, closer. So. PATH Act, um, there were several extenders that were made permanent for individuals, uh, state and, and local sales tax deduction. So you're able to take that deduction on your taxes in, in place of the income tax deduction. And so this uh, election uh, is available now permanently going forward. And um, the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which is a tax credit for college education. So that, uh, that, uh, um, Sorry, getting technology whizzed here. Um, is avail available permanently going forward also. The uh, child tax credit, believe it or not, was a every year extension, was made permanent, and it was actually expanded. Um, the amount was uh, increased, so. Earned income credit. This is a tax credit given to low income individuals with children that have uh, wages from an employer. That was also made permanent. Teacher's classroom expense deduction, so they're able to take a deduction rather than uh, treat those expenses that they pay personally as charitable contributions. And uh, it's a real benefit to teachers because they all have out-of-pocket expenses that they pay every year, and so 
by making it a permanent deduction, it takes it out of a, an area on the tax return that may be limited um, due to their income. Charitable di uh, distributions from IRAs. So um, about five years ago, they put in place a, the ability for individuals with large balances in their IRAs to make it a direct charitable contribution, surpass their tax return, um, and not be taxed on that income. So they made that permanent in PATH Act. And qualified conservation contributions. So these are qual uh, conservation easements. Um, we've seen um, a, a rapid expansion of them uh, in, the, in the near future also. Two-year extensions for individuals. So these are the things that were um, uh, uh, only for, for the next uh, two years. Qualified tuition-related expense deductions. So if you're not able to take a credit for tuition, you take a deduction on the front page of your return, um, and that will only be in effect for the next two years. Mortgage debt exclusion. Um, so that is if you have um, uh, mortgage debt that's uh, waived by the bank, you can exclude that from your income. So that's only a two-year extension. Business extenders. These are the ones that most of you in the room care about, um, that we sat and sweated over in December of 15 trying to figure out whether or not we were we were going to uh, get them. Co code section 179, the ability to expense equipment one time, $500,000 permanent. It's good going forward. We don't have to make that conversation anymore. Research tax credit was made permanent. Um, the research tax credit is a tax credit that's been taken for 20 years and every year it was renewed and so they made it permanent this year which I think affirms uh, Congress's intent for the research tax credit to be a long-term incentive for businesses to create jobs. Um, we're seeing a lot of activity in that uh, realm right now. 100% gain exclusion on qualified small business stock. So if you sell qualified bu small business stock, which is stock that you originally purchased, held it over a certain period of time, you'll be, you're able to exclude the gain on that. So that was uh, made permanent. And reduced recognition period for S corporation built-in gains for um, any of you that are in the C-Corp world, when you convert to an S corporation, you have built-in gains that it's baggage, basically, that goes with you. You have to continue to treat those gains as, uh, as C-corporation income for a certain period of time. And so they made that uh, reduced recognition period uh, five years on that. So other permanent business extenders. 15-year straight-line cost recovery for qualified leasehold improvements. This was a big deal. Um, 15 years on a qualified leasehold improvement is a substantial uh, deduction over the, what it was before. And so we're able to um, take, that, uh, take those deductions much faster. And restaurant property was a big one. So we had actually a couple of clients that we used that on for, for their restaurant equipment um, because it um, definitely helped them out in the short term. Employer wage credits for employees who are active duty members of the uniform service. So if you have anybody that's active duty, um, there is a wage credit that uh, was made permanent for them. Dividends from RICS. There's none in the room, I promise. Um, subpart F exception for active financing income was made um, permanent. Charitable deductions for contribution of food inventory. Um, so this was uh, enacted in uh, Bush years, and um, it was uh, made permanent. Tax treatment of certain payments to controlling exempt organizations. So this is in the nonprofit world. If you have a controlled organization, you're able to exempt um, certain tax payments from them. Basis adjustment in stock when an S corporation makes a charitable contribution of property. So in uh, prior law, we weren't able to uh, increase the basis of a stock because of a charitable contribution because it wasn't taxed. And so this gave us the ability to increase the basis, which is important if you sell your business later, your ba you want your basis to be higher because then the gain will be uh, reduced. Minimized low income housing tax credit for non-federally subsidized buildings was made permanent. Military housing allowance exclusion. Uh, RIC qualified investment entity treatment on FERPTA. I had to get all of those in there. There was lots of them. So uh, five-year extensions for business. So this is the stuff that we're going to get 
for five years. So bonus depreciation was in addition to 179, you're able to take in the first year of a purchase of a new piece of equipment. For 15, 16, and 17, it's 50%, and then it drops to 40, and then to 30, and then it's gone. So in 2020, we won't have that anymore, um, but we still have the 179, so. Work opportunity tax credit. It's a tax credit for, uh, for helping individuals with uh, getting back on their feet and getting back to work. New markets tax credit, those are certain identified um, markets throughout the United States. They actually allocate a dollar amount to that and it's, it was three and a half billion. They've used up about uh, 500,000 of it so far, so there's still plenty left. Two-year business extenders, Indian employment credit, accelerated depreciation, railroad track maintenance credit, empowerment zone incentives, film and television expensing, mine rescue team training credit. Election to expense mine safety equipment, qualified zone academy bonds, three year recovery period for certain race horses. That was a really important one. I'm serious, it was a big, it was a big deal. Uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, seven year recovery period for motorsports entertainment complexes. That one I haven't seen nearly as big an impact. Uh, code section 199 deduction for Puerto Rico. So prior to this, uh, Puerto Rico wasn't able to take the domestic production activities deduction, which is a manufacturing incentive for um, uh, items produced inside the United States. It's up to a 9% deduction for manufacturing. Many of us in the room are manufacturers. And uh, so this is a very important uh, deduction that wasn't available to Puerto Rico, but was uh, expanded uh, during this, this bill. Uh, cover over of rum excise taxes, very important. Economic development credit for American Samoa. There were some energy extenders, I'll just go through them really fast. Um, tw the 25C credit, uh, 199 deduction, production and credits. There were some solar incentives that we've seen a little bit of activity here. Um, uh, credit for two-wheeled plug-in electrical vehicles I think has spurred a lot of uh, a lot of activity in that area. And the credit for energy efficient new homes was put in place uh, for um, uh, uh, permanently, which is a 45L credit. That's a credit if you make a dwelling unit that is meets uh, energy efficient standard, you get a $2,000 credit for each unit. It can be very lucrative if you're building a multi-unit building. Two thousand sixteen saw so that's uh, all the PATH Act stuff. There were some. There, there was not a lot of activity in two thousand sixteen as far as new bills that were put in place, but there were a few. Uh, the Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act uh, was signed in March, which included an increase um, in the penalty for failure to file your tax return. So if any of your, I know none of you in this room are contemplating that. But if you happen to know someone who doesn't file their return on time, it uh, nearly doubled the penalty. The Recovering Missing, Missing Children's Act was signed in June, and so this is a law that allows the IRS to share tax information with authorities in the search of uh, missing children uh, and the investigations. This one was really important. U.S. Appreciation for Olympians Act uh, excludes income on the value of the metal. So they don't have to pay tax on the metal anymore. They're very valuable, actually. Uh, 21st Century Cures Act uh, allows certain small businesses to use qualified small business health reimbursement arrangements without uh, violating ACA. Combat Injured Veterans Tax Fairness Act. This is uh, combat veterans who receive disability payments. Many times we're being taxed on those disability payments. This makes it clear that they're tax free and that they don't, uh, they don't have to have any uh, taxes withheld on that. So there, in addition to the bills that were signed in 2016, several initiatives were created um, at the IRS and um, Many of those 
related to um, individuals. The IRS um, clarified the definition of marriage for everybody to file, um, whether it's a same-sex marriage or not. So it uh, clarified that, that federal tax um, rules regarding that. There was a Supreme Court Oh, mortgage interest deduction. So uh, the IRS announced in July that it's going to acquiesce in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So there was a, uh, a case that involved uh, two individuals that bought, purchased a residence, and they were trying to claim the mortgage interest deduction uh, limit for each of the individuals. And the IRS stepped in and said, you can only claim interest on $1.1 million worth of interest or $1.1 million worth of debt um, per, per property. And uh, the Ninth Circuit um, went against the IRS and said, no, that limit is per person. So if multiple people buy a home, they each get the $1.1 million limit. So it enables groups of people who want to live together the ability to have more mortgage debt. Deducted. Um, the 60-day rollover deadline for IRAs was ex was extended, and so the time limit for a re retirement plan distribution rollover. The IRS described a number of mitigating circumstances, so they issued a regulation that basically gave all of these different circumstances where a 60-day rollover was permitted, even though on the face of it, it appeared like they had violated the rules. Um, uh, the IRS also is making changes to the estate tax valuation regime. So this is uh, in response to um, how estates are valued and how we might get um, um, value out of someone's estate. The IRS was concerned about uh, generation skipping uh, trusts, and so they um, made a rule that um, it's code section 2704. They proposed regulations to, a, to address the abuses that were happening in that area. And um, um, the estate consistent basis reporting code section 6035, so what they said was that whatever is reported for your basis on your estate tax return is what you have to use as the basis when you sell the property. Um, surprisingly, there were some instances where people were using different basis uh, for that stuff. There were also some uh, uh, regulations that came out for businesses on, um, during the year. The use of a, of a partnership as a business entity. So the IRS clarified that if you're in a partnership, you are not an employee. There were uh, some practitioners and people across the country that were trying to make the case. Um, because of the uh, favorable tax treatment of an S corporation and the ability to only be taxed on your wages as self-employment income, they were trying to make the case that they could actually apply that to a partnership. The IRS clarified that if you're in a partnership, all your income is subject to self-employment tax no matter what. You cannot be an employee if you own uh, part of the partnership. Partnership audits, so they've changed the audit regime. It used to be that when a partnership was audited, the, audited and there were any changes to the income that was reported, those changes flowed out to uh, the partners and they reported uh, those on their individual returns and then they paid the tax. So they've changed that regime and what's gonna happen now is the partnership can actually be assessed the penalty and pay all the tax on behalf of the partners. It doesn't have to flow out to each um, partner. Oh, 2017 predictions. This is the fun part, right? I'll tell you what's going to happen this year. Like, I really know. Um, President Trump's agenda. <laughs> Last year, I don't think we thought we'd be having this conversation, but we are today. So, um, so the president's come out with uh, his 100-day plan, and inside that 100-day plan is a tax plan. And that tax plan includes four primary objectives. Um, the first is, if you're single and earn less, or this, this was his campaign pledge, so this goes all the way back to two years. 
So if you're single, earn less than 25,000 or married, uh, jointly earn less than 50, you'll not owe any income tax. Um, other Americans will get a simple tax code with four brackets. This is what he said during the campaign. Um, no business of any size will pay more than 15%, and no family will have to pay the death tax. So that was the, the campaign promise on taxes. This is the contract with the American voter that came out um, just recently. This is uh, his first push on, at uh, tax reform. The Middle Class Tax Relief and Simplification Act is what it's going to be called. Uh, middle class family with two children get a 35% tax cut. Middle class family is uh, income of 75,000 a year. So that was that's that is where that number comes from because I know everybody. I mean, I instantly started trying to do the numbers on what's middle class. For uh, for purposes of this act, it's 75,000. Actually, if you're if you're above 75,000, it's more like 40%. So um, tax brackets reduced from seven to three. This is a compromise. In his original campaign promise, he wanted four brackets. The reason he's dropping to three is because that's what Congress wants. Um, they want three brackets. Business tax bracket lowered from 35% to 15%. This is only on corporations, not on pass-through entities. So S corporations will still be taxed at the individual level. There are some discussions about how to mitigate that um, because it, that can be a problem. Um, and then repatriated money can be brought back at uh, 10%. The estimate is something like $2.5 trillion outstanding that could be brought back to the United States, put to work. Um, it's just not going to come here unless that rate drops. These are the three brackets. The highest bracket's 33%. Right now, it's 39.6%. So. It also included, because we're not just going to get a tax cut, is most, um, so there are, is debate right now between Congress and the President over this itemized deduction limit. I think the compromise is single 100,000, married 200,000. So once your itemized deductions go above that, you're just, it's capped. That's the most you'll be able to deduct. He's got to expand the base, right, so he can still get as much revenue. It's going to eliminate alternative minimum tax, which is going to make about 20 people in this room's lives a whole lot nicer. <laughs> Get rid of that AMT. Um, personal exemptions, gone. So right now you get $4,000 for each personal exemption on your tax return. That's you, your kids, whoever you claim as a dependent. You won't get those anymore. Also repeal head of household status. So that's a special bracket for um, single individuals who have children, that will go away. You'll just be single or married. What has he done so far? Um, so it's been a busy two days. I was just checking again to see if anything changed. Um, so the executive order to roll back ACA regulations was put in place. That was signed almost immediately. Freeze on any new pending regulation or government hire. So government hiring's uh, been frozen. Halted uh, pending reduction in mortgage premium insurance. So um, uh, the Obama um, administration had put in place a rule that was going to allow for a deduction there. He stopped it. Withdrew from TPP. Obviously, there's a lot of debate about the effect that that's going to have on, on us and our view in the, in the world. And then reinstated the Mexico City policy. This is the guy you really want to pay attention to. He has way more power than the president when it comes to tax reform. Kevin Brady is the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. He is the guy that decides whether or not the legislation is going to make it to the floor of the House or not. Um, it has to get through his committee first. Um, he has always been a staunch proponent of lowering taxes, simplifying the code. He, if you actually go and look at his website, um, he has his ideal tax return. It's like six lines and it's a postcard. And that's where he wants to take the, the IRS code. Still going to take an accountant to figure out the number that you put on the postcard, but just want to be clear about that. Somebody asked me about that yesterday. <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, so obviously, uh, top priority. Uh, his tax philosophy has been stated for many years. He took over Ways and Means um, 
when the exiting chairman of Ways and Means was promoted to Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. So that's, uh, Paul Ryan used to have that control. So it's a very good scenario for taxes because Paul Ryan understands all the intricacies of taxes. He isn't coming from a committee that didn't deal with it. Um, simpler, flare, uh, fairer, flatter tax. He wants to close all the loopholes. Um, he doesn't raise taxes to bail out Washington spending. Small business no longer pays a higher rate than big business. He's totally on board with dropping the rate to 15%. Um, stops forcing companies to shift jobs overseas. There is debate right now between the administration and Ways and Means about how to do this. Kevin Brady has a proposal in place, um, which is a, what's called an offset, a border offset tax. Basically, it disallows any foreign sales to be added to your income and disallows any imported costs to be added. So it's just a different way of doing the math. Um, he, he was on CNBC yesterday talking about how simple it was, and he couldn't explain it to the guys on there. So Trump's plan is to just tax imports. Um, so there's just going to be a penalty tax on any revenues um, generated from imported goods. Um, he wants to limit spending and built, built for growth. I would advise you, if you're very interested in this, which I am, is uh, if you go to Ways and Means, the website is great. Has all of the tax bills that are coming as they come when they go through committee. You can read them, you can understand them. Even if you go to Kevin Brady, uh, his, his website um, for his congressional district, he's in uh, Texas, uh, right outside of Houston is where his, uh, district is, has a great website with a great um, paper about what exactly he wants to do with taxes. Uh, so right now, um, the things that he's brought forward that he is talking to the administration, he was adamant yesterday in all of the um, media outlets that he was talking to that he has been in um, some pretty deep talks already with the administration about how to move these things forward, wants to completely restructure the IRS. Um, which is a welcome uh, for us that have been dealing with the IRS. It's been a nightmare. Um, IRS right now is at the lowest levels in 30 years as far, as far as employee count, which makes it very, very difficult to get issues resolved. We're talking about three, four hour wait times on the phone to just get through to a person and then you get somebody that has worked there for two weeks. And so it's, a, it's very frustrating. Even at the revenue agent level, it's frustrating to, uh, to have to um, try to teach tax law <laughs> to the IRS. Um, they've had a real vacuum because of the understaffing that's occurred. Um, all of the experienced people have departed and so we're left with some fairly new people, which is fine, but they're, they're getting trained on seven year ago tax law and they still have those gigantic servers stored somewhere with like dot matrix printers and they punch things in and it takes like seven minutes for it to come back to the screen. So it's, um, it's very difficult. Obviously they need to install a new com commissioner of the IRS. We'll see what happens there. I'll talk a little bit about that in, in the next slide. He also wants to create an office of dispute resolution. This is, um, I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide too, but an Office of Dispute Resolution which would give us taxpayers an alternative to get um, issues resolved in a timely manner. So when we, we have what's called the taxpayer advocate right now, but in order for the taxpayer advocate be, to be invoked right now, you have to basically demonstrate a mistake by the IRS. Um, this will allow you to go into fast track resolution to get issues resolved because um, we don't like to, that's one of the things that makes it impossible to make decisions going forward because you can't, you can't make decisions about this year when you're still debating last year with the IRS. So um, clear out the bureaucracy. I know that's a general statement, but that's on his website. And then modernize the information systems. That, like I said, the computers are awful. It's, it's really awful. So Steve Mnuchin is the um, Treasury nominee. He will have a lot of power over this, um, the coming regulations and IRS. He's going to be the point person for tax reform. He said it. He said it right there in front of the confirmation hearings. I am the person that, that uh, President Trump will look to for ideas about how to reform the tax code. Um, he has some uh, very good ideas when it comes to IRS. He came right out off the bat and said he wanted 